Welcome to New Day Church Online. My name is John, and whoever you are, wherever you're at, whenever you're watching this, thank you so much for tuning in today. We don't think it's an accident that you're watching this right now. We know God has a good plan and purpose as you journey with us today. Our mission at New Day is really simple. We exist to help new people find their new day in the name of Jesus, and that includes you. If you have any questions about New Day Church or want to connect with us in any way, visit us online at newdaychurch.com. Also, we want you to be connected with everything happening online with New Day, and the best way to do that is to connect with our social media channels. So if you haven't already, go like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. Also, if you want to help get this message out, get this service out, get the hope of Jesus out, like and share this video for the whole world to see. And lastly, we want to help you grow in your relationship with God. The Bible says that if we draw near to God, that he will draw near to us. Think about it. Today, you could take a next step in your walk with Jesus. And so we want to help you do that. All you have to do is go to newdaychurch.com, click the Take My Next Step link, and there you can sign up for baptism. You can make a decision to follow Jesus, join a group or a Bible study. But if you'll do that, we'll follow up with you and we'll help you get connected to your new day in the name of Jesus. And so as we continue today, I wanna to encourage you to open your heart and your mind to everything that God would have for you today. We're so glad you're here and thanks again for tuning in.
before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. For you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. For you have been so, so kind. To me, sing over the overwhelming and all oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the night and night. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it. But still, you give yourself away. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, yeah. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Sing when I was your foe. Was your fault, still your love fought for me. For you have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Yes, you did, Lord. And you have been so, so kind. To me, yeah, and all the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, but still, you give yourself away. Jesus' name, 
Amen. Here in a moment, we're going to hear a helpful message from God's Word. But before we do that, we're going to worship God through giving. New Day is 100% supported by people that generously give to support the work of God here in our church. If you're new, please don't feel like you have to give anything. We're just glad you're here and you're checking it out. And we see this service as our gift to you. But if you call New Day Church home, or if this has blessed you in any way, we would encourage you to partner with us financially and to support God's work here at New Day financially. If you'd like to give financially, you can simply go to newdaychurch.com give, and all the information and the link will be there. You can also mail checks in, and you can find our address online at newdaychurch.com as well. But before we transition, a couple announcements just really quick. First is that if you've been impacted by the coronavirus financially, we would love to help you. We have people that have generously given to meet needs. And so if you have a need and want to let us know, all you have to do is go to newdaychurch.com, fill out the form on our website, and we'll follow up with you. Also, if you need to connect during this time or you need community, we have Bible studies and groups that are meeting right now that you can hop into. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can go online as well and sign up and we'll follow up with you. So this time, let's turn our attention to God's Word. Let's open our hearts and our minds to whatever God would have for us today. Well, thank you again for joining us at New Day Online. Uh, I believe that God has a message for you today, uh, one in which He uh, wishes to encourage you and also challenge you to live in deeper faith and communion with Him. And I'm really excited to be the one that gets to share that message with you today. Uh, But before we get to our passage, I want you to imagine something with me. I want to imagine that you're not feeling well and you go to the doctor and you get to the doctor's office and you walk up to the receptionist's desk and they hand you the clipboard with like 20 pages. You know what I'm talking about. So you sit down, you fill out the clipboard with all these pages and you hand it back and then they hand it back to you because of course you missed a page or two. So you finally get that all sorted out. You sit down and you wait right? You wait for 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes for them finally to call you inside. And you go inside to what I call the smaller waiting room in which you wait for the doctor in the patient room. So maybe it's another 15 to 20 minutes, right? So you're imagining this with me. Finally, a doctor comes in and you begin to describe to her the different symptoms that you have. And she begins to examine you and she gets a very grave look on her face. And she says, you know what? Uh, I'm really glad that you came in today because you have a really serious condition. Uh, But I want you to take heart because I have the medicine for you to get better and for you to get healthy. And so she gives you this uh, vial, this bottle of pills, this medicine. And this is what she tells you to do. She says, I want you to take this, put it in your pocket, and I want you to carry it with you no matter where you go. When you go to work, I want you to make sure that you have this bottle of pills in your pocket. And when you go home, make sure you don't leave it on the counter. Take it with you in your pocket. When you go to the grocery store, make sure that it's with you. And you have a very puzzled look on your face and you say, well, aren't I supposed to take the pills? And she says, no, no, no. I just want you to carry the bottle around. Now, if you have a doctor who says to do that, I really encourage you to find a new doctor because any sane person knows that you have to actually take the medicine in order to get healthy, in order to get well. And as crazy as that story is, I often think this is the way that we approach God. We know that God has the answers. We know that he has the medicine that we need in order to get us well, in order to shape us after his likeness. And yet far, far too often, we take the Bible, we carry it around with us, we read it, but we don't actually expect to go through the things that it says that we're going to go through. We don't actually take the medicine and recognize that God uses not just what we read in the Bible, but our experiences as well to shape us after his image. The Bible talks a lot about suffering. It talks a lot about trials. And it talks a lot about what we're going to talk about today, which is wilderness seasons of our life. A wilderness season is simply a season where we're experiencing some lack or some crisis of faith. It usually happens after we lose a job. It can happen like in a season like we're in right now, COVID-19, where the world is turned upside down. Wilderness sometimes looks like a season of spiritual dryness where we're going to the Lord and it feels like he's very far and disconnected from us. 
These seasons can be extended. They can happen over the course of several weeks or months or sometimes years. Or they can be kind of a moment in time in which we enter into the wilderness in which we're called to trust the Lord. I know that many of you right now, I I know you personally, and I know that you're going through seasons of wilderness. I know people in our church who have lost their job because of COVID-19, and they're going through this season of doubt and of anxiety and of questioning the Lord. Some of you I don't know, but some of you are going through seasons like this. And I hope that my message today, I hope that the word that God has for you Uh, is one that encourages you to persevere in the faith, even in the midst of this season, and to see it not just as something to be endured, but something in which God is going to teach you and grow closer to you in the midst of this season. So I'd love for you to open up with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 2. And uh, this may be a book that you're not super familiar with. Uh, I was excited to kind of pick this passage because I know that many of us aren't familiar with many books of the Old Testament, and so I'm excited to dive into it. Deuteronomy is uh, toward the beginning of the Old Testament, and as you flip to Deuteronomy chapter 8, I just want to explain some of the context. And so if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, it primarily centers on a nation of people called the Israelites or the Hebrews. And you'll see that God has a very special relationship with them in the Old Testament that ultimately leads to the coming of Jesus and his special relationship with all people who put trust and faith in him. And the book of Deuteronomy essentially follows the people of Israel who were enslaved in the nation of Egypt for 400 years. And you'll remember probably a character Uh, out of the Old Testament named Moses. And he was the person who led the people out of enslavement in Egypt toward the promised land where God promised to spend uh, time with them and to make his home with them as a nation. And so the book of Deuteronomy follows the people as they leave uh, the place of Egypt and and they walk through a place called the wilderness or the the region of Sinai. And this is kind of where we pick up. The people have gone through this wilderness region and they're standing at the precipice of the land that God had promised them. And this is what uh, Moses says to the people in verse two. He says, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you, uh, that he might show you that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So this is Moses talking to the people after they've been in this kind of long wilderness experience that lasted for 40 years. I can't imagine going through the wilderness for 40 years or a season of dryness for 40 years, but this was their experience. And as they're standing on the promise that God uh, had called for them into this new land, this is what Moses says. He says, remember this time of testing and what it did in you, and the purpose for which God had for it in you. It's very interesting when you look at this. If you actually look at a map between Egypt and where the promised land was uh, in this time period in the Bible, in fact, it only took a few weeks to get from Egypt to the land of Israel, to the promised land, and yet it took them 40 years to get there. I was reading one commentary on this and uh, the, the person was talking about how there was much better ways to get to the land that God promised them. And yet, and yet God led them straight through the wilderness. And, and so the commentator was saying, God makes a pretty terrible travel agent, right? Don't book God as your travel agent. But in fact, he makes a really amazing God because God led them into the wilderness in order to grow them, in order to humble them, and in order to to test them. You see, God was more concerned not about where they were going, but about what he was doing in them in the midst of that season. And in the same way, our salvation is more than a destination. In fact, God is doing work in us, pruning us, testing us, humbling us. And in the midst of a wilderness season, we have to recognize that this is exactly what God is doing, however long it takes. Look at verse 2. 
Moses says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. So here's the theological point. Here's the thesis kind of of the passage. God loves the wilderness because in the wilderness, God does his deepest work in us. You and I don't love the wilderness because the wilderness is marked by all those things I mentioned, spiritual dryness, pain, suffering, lack, and loss. It's a season in which we're called to challenge our faith and grow in our trust and dependency on the Lord. And in our flesh, we don't like those things. So we don't like the wilderness, but God loves the wilderness. God loves the wilderness. God loves to lead us into barren and dry places because these are the very places in which he calls us to trust in him the most. I love what Billy Graham, a famous evangelist said. He said, mountaintops are for views and inspiration, but fruit is grown in the valley. God does his deepest work in the valleys of our life because in those places we're called to to grow our faith, to press on past the, the faith that we had before into what he has for us. In fact, I was doing a little research and I found that you cannot find one major biblical character, Old Testament or New Testament, who didn't go through some sort of wilderness experience, whether that was literal or whether that was metaphorical. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus. All these characters entered into the wilderness. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David, Elijah, all these people entered into the season of wilderness in moments of weakness and of desperation. But in every single instance, God called them out of the wilderness with fresh power, fresh conviction, and a fresh identity and a fresh calling to serve and be on mission for him. And I had someone tell me recently, and uh, I've been thinking about it ever since. He said, if Jesus can make his throne in the grave, literally Jesus made his throne in the grave on the cross, then he can certainly make his throne in our wilderness. See, God loves the wilderness. God loves seasons of lack. God loves taking things away from us for a season because in those places, we find that we can trust him more and our faith deepens and grows and stretches to new heights. Look back at verse two. What does the wilderness do? What should you look out for in seasons of wilderness? So it says, remember how the Lord your God led you into the wilderness these 40 years. To do what? It says, to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. So as you go through a wilderness season, number one, I would encourage you to let the wilderness humble you. It says, God led them into the wilderness to humble them. I find it really funny that we all kind of want to be humble, but none of us want to be humbled, right? As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we know it's good to be humble. We know it's good to be fully dependent on God, but we hate the process through which we become fully dependent on God. And yet humility is the very first step of our spiritual formation. Really, humility is step number one in the Christian life. It's the only way that God does any more work in us. This is where God begins his education. And if we're not allowing ourselves to be humbled in times of wilderness, then uh, God's not going to teach us anything else. He's going to start with teaching us humility. And after we learn that, then he moves on to bigger and greater things. And this is kind of Israel's negative example in the Bible. If you look at the Old Testament in this wilderness wandering, the reason that they had to wander for 40 years is because even though God continued to lead them and guide them, they still would not trust him completely. They still would not humble themselves, but trusted in themselves, even in the midst of the wilderness season. And so God had them continue on for 40 years, hoping that they would learn to trust him completely. And I've known people at different times in my life who just seem to be stuck 
in life. And, and maybe you know people like this, where it feels like they never get traction. It feels like they continue to revolve around the same problems over and over and over again. And you try to tell them like, hey, why don't you try this? Or, or, or why don't you go to the Lord? Or why don't you try to join Christian community? And they say, oh yeah, that's not really for me. And yet they continue on in the same problems and the same issues. Humility is important for us to learn. Jesus knows that. And so he instructs us throughout his word to humble ourselves and to trust him. Teachability is the first trait of being a disciple of Jesus. I love the way John Piper, who's a a pastor, uh, he put it this way. He says, the wilderness exposes what's inside our our chest like little else does. For all the beauty of the promised lands, hills, and forests, they offer dozens of hideouts for our idols. It is frighteningly easy to give lip service to God while our hearts are lost in his gifts. I love this. He says, we can sing hallelujah, all I have is Christ, with both hands lifted, while the cords of our heart are wrapped around things like our marriage or a friendship or our career, our earthly security. See, the wilderness is interesting because in the wilderness, God is calling us to trust him. But in our flesh, we want to trust in ourselves. And so if we're going to be people who are humbled before the Lord, we have to trust him even as we're losing control. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, My wife and I recently went through a wilderness experience ourselves, and it happened on January 28th of this year when our son Cameron was born. And we had an idea of what it was going to be like when we went into the hospital. We knew that we were going to have to get induced and that uh, Sarah was going to have to begin labor that way. And uh, so we go into the hospital and it began this process of, I forget how many hours. It started one night and it went through the night and through the afternoon the next day. And by the evening, uh, even after being induced, uh, Sarah wasn't making any progress in her labor. And the doctor came in and she said, you know what? Not only is the baby's heart rate going at dangerous levels every time we give this medicine, but Sarah's heart rate is also going to dangerous levels and you're getting no progress in this labor. And she said the words that we did not want to hear, you're going to have to go in for a C-section. And that was something that we wanted to avoid at all costs. And again, we had this picture of what delivery was going to look like and and the baby was going to come and we were going to be joyful. And then we got these terrible words. And in that moment, Sarah and I entered into the wilderness and everything after that was a blur. I remember they were throwing scrubs at me and I was putting the scrubs on and they were telling me to get all our stuff out of the room. And they were hiking up the wheels on Sarah's bed and they were rolling her down to the operating room. And I can remember sitting outside of that room in this very barren, empty hallway as they prepped her for surgery. And I remember I was literally shaking. I was shaking and I was crying and I was calling out to God saying, God, you've got to do something right now. You must intervene. I was so afraid. But in that moment, I believe that God was calling me to a level of faith that I've never had before. In that moment, God wounded me very deeply. He scarred me, and I still carry that scar even today. And it's a truth that I want to remind you that in order to get the deep truths of the Bible, in order to get deep faith in God, we have to have deep scars. That in fact, God is like a surgeon who puts in us deep incisions, who actually inflicts pain sometimes in order to make us healthy and dependent on him. See, we can't be completely dependent on God just reading the Bible and not expecting to go through trials and tribulations ourselves. But in fact, it's reading the Bible and seeing the examples of Jesus and of the other followers of God in the Bible. It's through that and through living that out in our own life that increases our faith. Deep truths require deep scars. So let this wilderness season of yours humble you. Come before the Lord broken. Say, God, I'm a smart person. I have an MBA. 
I've worked at this job for 15 years and yet they let me go. Come to God in that brokenness and say, Lord, what are you doing right now in my life? How are you calling me to trust you and depend on you? So let the season call you to humility. Look back at verse two. So it says the Lord led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you, number one, and also to test you in order to know what's in your heart. So not only should you let the wilderness uh, humble you, but you should also let the wilderness test you. It says he tested them in order to know what was in their heart. God tested Israel. And uh, you might look at this passage and you might say, why did God need to test him? Didn't he already know what they were going to do, right? Because God's all-knowing, God's all-powerful, God knows the future. We believe that biblically. Then why would he need to test them? That's a good question. And the answer is God wasn't testing them so that he would know. God was testing them so that they would know what was in their heart. See, God causes us or God leads us into seasons of wilderness so that we would know what's in our heart, that we would know the strength of our faith, that we would know and and that the season would reveal the idols in our heart. This is what God does in this season. And the Israelites often are used as a bad example of this because the Israelites, uh, even though they were in the wilderness, even though God was taking care of them, even though literally bread was falling from the sky and then quail would fall from the sky, God provided for them in every way possible. They still did something that angered God and that showed that they had idols in their heart. Over and over and over again, the Israelites said, I wish we were back in Egypt. And the irony of that is crazy because Egypt is a place in which they were enslaved. And yet how often do we in our own life, when we come across hardship, when we come across trials and temptations, do we go back to the things that we used to go to before we followed Jesus? Like Israel, we say, man, I wish I were back here. And I believe that God tests us in the wilderness to remind us that God isn't back in Egypt. God isn't back in the things that we used to use to cope with the trials and struggles of life. But in fact, God is in the wilderness. See, the lie is this belief that God is not with us in the midst of the trial and the temptation. But in fact, the truth is, that's the very place in which God resides. I find it interesting how I've been reading different articles about um, COVID-19 and kind of this current season. And one of the articles I was reading was saying that really uh, there's been a huge correlation over the past month between the rise of the coronavirus and the rise of isolation and quarantine and the rise of addictions and the rise of alcohol relapse and the rise of increased pornography usage and the rise of marital problems. It's interesting how the season of wilderness is drawing up the things that are deep within us, that God is always, has always been, is, and always will be calling us out of. So seasons of wilderness reveal this dysfunction in us. And God reveals those things not to judge us or to condemn us, but to call us out of those things. The wilderness has always been a time biblically and historically for God's church and for God's people of pruning and of purification. And like the Bible says, no discipline, no purification is uh, 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 enjoyable uh, in the moment, but it produces in us fruit that lasts a lifetime. So if you're going through a season of wilderness, just know that you're going to face temptation to go back to Egypt to go back to the things that used to make you feel good. But God is calling us in this season to pursue him with everything that we have, to trust him and to call on his name when we need it. So the wilderness humbles us, the wilderness tests us. And then let's look at the last verse here, verse three. It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which is bread uh, that fell from heaven, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. 
I feel like so far as I've been talking about a wilderness season, I, I feel like I've been saying things like, it's hard and it's a time of testing. And it's a time where God is going to break you. And it's a time of difficulty. And in many ways, all those things are true. But the most amazing thing about the wilderness is that God reveals himself in new and profound ways. God reveals himself to us in the wilderness in ways that he would not reveal himself in seasons of prosperity, in seasons of security, and in seasons where we're not lacking, when we have everything that we need. But in fact, in these seasons, God shines through the most. Truly amazing in verse three, how it says he caused you to hunger and then he fed you. He caused you to hunger and then he fed you. God will make you hungry. You see, the wilderness is meant to starve you of the comforts of this world so that you can see God as the only one who truly satisfies. And God can't do that when you're full of life, when you're full of security, when your bank account is full, when your job is going well, when everything is right with your kids, when everything is right with the world. God can't show you that he's the only one you truly need. Like the quote says, you don't know that God is all you truly need until God is all you truly have. I also love what Augustine says. He says, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. King David in his wilderness experience cried out to God and he says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. You see, God uses a wilderness season. God uses spiritual dryness to show us that God is the only true source of water. He's teaching us in the wilderness, when you're thirsty, come to me. When you're hungry, come to me. Jesus cried out, I am the river of living water. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In our passage here, God says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the wilderness trains us to know that God is all we truly need. We need nothing else beside him. And so uh, wilderness is called to make us hungry so that we would go to him and be satisfied with him alone. We should love the wilderness because God loves the wilderness and God loves to reveal himself in new ways in the wilderness. Let me give you some examples. Abraham went into the wilderness and God revealed himself as the God of the nations. In fact, God changed Abram's name to Abraham. First it meant father, and then it meant father of many nations. And so Abraham came to this very deep realization that God was the God of the entire world. And he kept that throughout his entire life. Moses went into the wilderness and he encountered God at the burning bush where God revealed himself as the I am, the Lord over everything. And Moses continued to have this deep trust that God is sovereign over everything for the rest of his life. Then you find Israel who went through the wilderness and God revealed himself as the provider in the barren place where God was teaching them that they didn't need to look to earthly comfort and security in order to have their needs met. But in fact, all they needed to do was look to God as the source of their daily food. And then you have the famous story of even Jesus in his humanity at the beginning of his ministry goes into the wilderness to be tested by God and to be tempted by Satan. And in that, God reveals himself as the faithful one who overcomes evil. You see, in my recent wilderness experience with the birth of my son, I recognize that God is the one who's ultimately the source of all life, the sustainer of life, and the one who's ultimately in control. I had no control in the middle of that season on that day. And yet I have a very deep rooted belief that God is ultimately in control of Cameron's life and not me. See, the wilderness is meant to make an impression on you 
It's meant to reveal God in a way that he's never revealed to you in the past and that he's calling you uh, to see and to recognize in this season. And so I wonder if you're in a wilderness season right now, what is God revealing to you? What new way are you seeing God in his word or in this season? What new level of trust? What new depth of faith is he taking to you? What new name is God revealing to you of himself in this season? Is it provider? Is it the one who breaks and rebuilds? What is it for you in this season? That's what he's calling you to understand. See, every person's wilderness season comes with doubt, comes with exhaustion, comes with hopelessness. And yet in every case in the Bible, and that I can testify in my own life, those things do show up. But God also shows up in a very profound way and real and powerful and memorable way. I guarantee it. I want to finish uh, today by kind of continuing on my own story of wilderness. I I mentioned kind of that day and uh, how it was a blur and how I was sitting in that hallway and how I was literally shaking uh, as I entered into the room and and as they were going to go in the C-section. But I didn't mention kind of what happened before that. Uh, A few weeks before you go into the hospital, if you're a parent, you know this, you go to an orientation. And we're first-time parents, and so we uh, went to the orientation for the very first time. And uh, we go in there, and you're huddled in this room with about six or seven other couples. And they're telling you, this is what your room looks like, and this is what this machine does. And nurses are going to be in and out, and they describe all these things. And in the course of our orientation, they also had this picture. And they started talking about... Uh, what happens when you undergo a C-section? And I remember they started passing this picture around, and it was a picture of the operating room uh, for getting a C-section at Memorial Hermann. I remember I got the picture, and I kind of looked at it, and I was like, oh, that's interesting. The one thing I remember is I remember the lights. I'm like, those are pretty cool lights that shine down. They must be pretty powerful. And I remember looking at the picture, and then I passed it on. And I had no idea in that moment that I was going to be in that room. And today, I want to encourage you with the fact that there is a huge difference and there's a huge gap between looking at the picture and experiencing what it entails. There's a difference between just looking at the Bible and expecting the things that happen in the Bible to happen to other people, taking a glance at it and saying, oh, yeah, that's nice. There's going to be suffering. Okay, and then moving on. There's a difference between that and recognizing that God teaches us, not just through the Bible, but through experience. God teaches us experientially. And he takes the deep truths of the Bible and he drives them deep into us through the experience. There's a difference between the picture and living it out. And when you're in the wilderness season, you're experiencing the gap between those two things. And I want to encourage you that God is teaching you that it is not pleasant. God knows it's not pleasant, but he's doing a miraculous and wonderful work through it. The amazing thing about all the wilderness stories in the Bible is that everyone who goes through the wilderness and trusts the Lord comes out with more power, more faith, a deeper sense of who God is, a deeper sense of who they are, and a deeper sense of the mission of God in this world. So I want you to know that you can look forward to that, that the same God who called you into the wilderness, led you into the wilderness, will also call you out of the wilderness and will lead you out of the wilderness. All you have to do is trust him. So today, again, I want to thank you so much for watching. And I want to encourage you, even as you go through this wilderness season, to remember that God is doing a deep work in you. And that through this, he's going to bring you out the other side more powerful, stronger, and having a deeper faith in him. It's painful in the moment, but it bears fruit for a lifetime. So thank you again for watching, and may God bless you this week. Thanks again so much for watching this online with us today. We hope the service blessed you and ministered to you wherever you're at. Once again, if you want to take a next step in your walk with God, we'd love to help you do that. Simply go to newdaychurch.com 
click the Take a Next Step link, and you can let us know about what your next step is, and we'll follow up with you and help you every single step of the way. Also, don't forget to like and to share this video to get this message out to your friends and to the entire world. But once again, thank you for joining us for New Day Church Online. Be blessed this week.